Isn't that cool? Yeah. Santa's reindeer. Yeah. What makes it so long like that? It's a bunch of different satellites. That's why I was wondering, what are they all syncing up or something? So, because it's just after launch, wow. they're all still pretty close together. But over time, they'll progressively get further and further apart from each other. Wow, that's weird. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Wow, it's like a caterpillar up there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, it's so shaky. I should put this on a tripod. Many have seen or heard of this. According to Starlink, it's called a sky train. In the first half of 2020, the internet was flooded with reports of strange lights in the sky. These were a new flavor of UFO, chains of up to 60 bright lights marching across the sky in eerie silence. Some people thought they were meteors, because of how bright they were, but they were moving too slowly and too regularly for your average shooting star. Some thought they were planes, but they seemed too far up, following huge arcs across the sky. They didn't have the flashing lights that are a giveaway for planes either. And some, inevitably, thought they were a neatly marching line of alien spacecraft. What else could produce such a regular chain of lights but an approaching extraterrestrial invasion force? Well, spacecraft they are, but alien they are not. In fact, they're part of a brand new enterprise by SpaceX to bring broadband internet to the entire globe. They call it Starlink. Each point of light is an individual satellite, orbiting about 300 kilometers above the Earth. Each satellite is surprisingly small, just the size of a dinner table, but it has flat, shiny surfaces and solar panels that reflect sunlight so we can see them when conditions are right. But reflective satellites in orbit above the Earth are nothing new. In fact, there are already more than 2,500 above our heads right now. So why do the Starlink satellites look so strange? Well, SpaceX's vision for Starlink is ultimately to have at least 12,000 satellites swooping around the Earth. Since May 2019, the satellites have been launched 60 at a time, on board the company's reusable Falcon 9 rockets. Once they're above the atmosphere, about 290 kilometers up, the payload is jettisoned from the rocket, and the package of 60 satellites is sent on its merry way. But to provide an even coverage of the Earth, each satellite has to be put on a very specific orbit. And that's where the SkyTrain comes in. Because for the first few months after they're launched, the satellites stay in a kind of holding pattern a graceful conga across the skies. Gradually, they use their onboard ion engines to thrust into a new orbit, to raise their altitude to 550 kilometers above the surface, and to spread out into the proper position. That's the official narrative. Now let's punch holes in the narrative and expose this deception. According to SpaceX, once the rocket is above the atmosphere, the payload of satellites are jettisoned about 300 kilometers up. That would be approximately the distance from Toronto to Kingston, Ontario. Remember that they are about the size of a kitchen table. At that distance, they would resemble a grain of sand, not 60 individual lights. This video was taken from a high-altitude balloon called a super-pressure balloon. The horizon appears curved due to a fisheye lens. We will talk about super-pressure balloons in a moment but I wanted you to notice the ground. This is from almost 23 kilometers up. You cannot make out a bus from that altitude, let alone a kitchen table. Now add another 256 kilometers to this height. Your eyes simply cannot see that far. Yet Starlink continues with this masquerade. As for reflection, even if the globe model is real, like they are pretending, these satellites are only 300 kilometers up. The sun would be on the opposite side of the Earth. In fact, they would be in Earth's shadow. There is simply no sunlight to reflect. None. The question still remains. If they are not satellites, what are they? I'd rather have a science balloon than a science satellite. 
With a balloon, there's no need for rockets. To get a satellite to hover over the same spot on Earth, geostationary orbit, you have to be 36,000 kilometers away, too far to use some sensors, like radar. A balloon can sit a thousand times closer, in the stratosphere, 30 to 40 kilometers above the Earth, and still be above 99% of the atmosphere with clear views of the stars or wide panoramas of Earth. You can bring down a balloon, tinker with onboard scientific equipment, and then launch again. Satellites, not so much. Cost is also a factor. NOAA's four new geostationary weather satellites are estimated to cost $11 billion, whereas a balloon flight might cost just a few hundred thousand dollars. NASA's been flying balloons for a long time, but without any steering capabilities, they drift in the wind across continents. Now, private industry is getting in the balloon game, with new technologies that are enabling balloons to hover over one spot. These balloons rise and fall in the stratosphere, catching countervailing breezes that allow them to stay roughly in the same place. What can a balloon with a scientific payload do? It can look down at the Earth, checking on storms or animal migrations. It can look out into space, peering at the surface of the sun or collecting cosmic rays. It can even do things in the stratosphere, like studying how ice crystals could reflect sunlight and cool the planet. How do you keep a balloon stable enough to use a telescope? Gyroscopes can help keep a platform pointed at its target, even as it sits in a twisting gondola. But this isn't an ad for scientific balloons. There are a few caveats. For example, while satellites last for years, the longest balloon flights have been a few months. And what goes up needs to come down, so most balloons come with parachutes that can bring their payloads down gently. Hi, I'm Nat. And I'm Lo. And this is our 20% project where we go around Google learning about all the stuff we're curious about. A few years ago, we heard about this crazy idea that Google X... Wait, did she just say Google X? Now I know where the name SpaceX came from. Yeah, that Google X wanted to use giant balloons to deliver the internet. Turns out it wasn't such a crazy idea after all because now it's a real project and it's called Loon. We reached out to see if there's any way that we could see what the team is up to these days. And then they basically asked us, hey, would you like to come to our giant hangar and help us pop balloons? So of course we said yes, that sounds awesome. So we went over to Moffett Field and got to hang out in a World War II blimp hangar that's five and a half acres inside. And we played with balloons with Mahesh and Pam and some of the other people on the Loon team. Can you describe what Project Loon is and how it got started? It all started out with uh, Larry and Sergey's vision where they basically wanted to connect the whole world. Right now, more than four billion people can't access the internet, and a lot of them live in rural and remote areas. So it's kind of easier and faster to think of a new solution rather than try to build the same kind of ground infrastructure that other places are using. What if we change the paradigm? People can live anywhere they want, but we take the tower and we actually float it up in the air. Specifically 12 miles up in the stratosphere, twice as high as planes fly, where there are these layers of wind that the balloons can use to sail around on. This is a loon balloon. It's a pumpkin-shaped, high-altitude, super-pressure balloon, which means a higher pressure inside than the pressure in the ambient outside. What's the, so what's the balloon inside the other balloon? That's a ballonet, which just means little balloon in French. So like in scuba diving, you put on weight to go down, and then you let the weight off to go up. This is very similar. The balloons are the size of a tennis court, and each kind of bulgy flower petal thing is a different lobe. There's 36 of them, and then 36 tendons wrapped around those that help carry load when the balloons are floating in the sky. One of the first big problems in the early days of Loon was leaks. Whoops. <laughs> These balloons are lasting five days, maybe 10 days. So what we did is we formed a leak squad. We all came together to say, what are all the sources of leaks? 
and then proving out by actually doing testing here at Moffitt and, and other ways. One of these very scientific tests was asking people assembling and walking on top of the balloons to wear a fluffier pair of socks. After six or seven months of testing and refining everything about their process, how they make the balloons, how they package them, how they unpackage them, how they launch them, they were able to take their balloons from lasting five days to... We are able to successfully get our balloons to last more than 100 days. Our longest lasting balloon was 187 days. Which basically means it went around the world like 10 times. It's like a big noodle. So even though the balloons are lasting longer these days, there's still plenty of things to test. Right now we're doing a bunch of tests to inflate to different pressures. So every 100 pascals, we're taking measurements on the film for strain and stretch. And they do this to purposely pop the balloon so that they can learn more about its strengths and weaknesses. I noticed my hands just barely touching it were like leaving imprints. So was I damaging it? No. So the film can handle a lot if you use all the surface area evenly. But if you say take a finger, you could easily poke through it. It's extremely stretchy at what we call ambient temperature. All these materials are optimized once it's up at float and cold. Because in Moffitt, they're testing at room temperature. But, you know, in the sky, it can be like negative 80 degrees at night. There aren't that many places on the ground that we can get something this big that cold. The McKinley Climatic Lab, which is part of the Eggling Air Force Base in Florida, it's a giant hangar, about half the size of uh, Moffett Field, that has unique capabilities of taking it down to minus 40, minus 60 degrees centigrade there. So we've inflated three balloons, and then we took the chamber down, simulated going into, into float. What is the trigger point? Where does it fail? Oh, you see the snow. Then we go do forensics afterward. So we'll pull the film down. We look at it with a polarized light filter. You can see things with this filter that your naked eye isn't gonna call out to you. And it really helps to look at what shape is it? What direction is it? Does it have any scratches? It's like shining a giant light on it and yeah. instantly everything is clear. For now, Luna's still in its testing phase. A couple years ago, they helped a rural farmer in New Zealand get online. And last year, they brought the internet to a school in a remote area of Brazil. And we just found out that next year, they'll begin testing in Indonesia and maybe a few other places. Our goal is over the next few years to be able to start providing good commercial service. Before making this episode, we used to think that Loon was just like a crazy idea. But now we realize if you look into the history of weather balloons and you know other scientific balloons, not this guy, you realize that they've done some pretty amazing things and they're not newbies to hanging out in the stratosphere. All Loon did was find another way to use them. One day, a balloon is gonna be flying up in the sky and we're not even gonna be able to see it, but someone is gonna be sharing a photo with their friend and it's gonna be because of that balloon we can't even see. Just like anything else, what was once crazy becomes normal. Would it not be outrageous to think that a balloon could drag a happy birthday sign behind it just like this plane. Now swap the sign for a string of lights, 60 lights long, like Christmas lights only more powerful, and float them 12 kilometers high. That is more believable than 60 satellites. Besides, countries like China would never let a low Earth orbit satellite invade their airspace. Let's now open up Dishy McFlatface. At the back, we have a pair of motors and an ethernet cable that connects to the router. Note that these motors don't continuously move Dishy to point directly at the Starlink satellite. They're used only for initial setup to get the dish pointed in the proper general direction. Opening up Dishy, we find an aluminum structural backplate, and on the other side, we find a massive printed circuit board or PCB. One side has 640 small microchips and 20 larger microchips organized in a pattern with very intricate traces fanning out from the larger to smaller microchips, along with additional chips including the main CPU and GPS module on the edge of the PCB. On the other side are 1400-ish copper circles with a grid of squares between the circles. On the next layer, there's a rubber honeycomb pattern with small, notched copper circles, and behind that, we find another honeycomb pattern, and then the front side of Dishy. 
So what are we looking at? Well, in essence, we have 1,280 antennas arranged in a hexagonal honeycomb pattern, with each stack of copper circles being a single antenna controlled by the microchips on the PCB. This massive array works together in what's called a phased array in order to send and receive electromagnetic waves that are angled to and from a Starlink satellite orbiting 550 kilometers above. As for the Starlink dish, is not a satellite dish at all. It is an array of cell phone antennas called a phased array. To get the speeds they can get, they are 5G antennas. Starlink is a great service for many, myself included, but please stop with this charade. We are now wise to it.